Hi, everyone, and welcome to a live chat with Nurse Linda. Today's topic is mental well being. Linda Schultz is a leader and provider of rehabilitation nursing for over 30 years and a friend of the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation for close to two decades. Now I'm going to turn it over to Linda. Hi, Linda. Hello, and thank you, Kaylee, and welcome, everyone. You know, whenever these Wednesday webinars come up, I always get real happy because I really enjoy talking with people and, and seeing what's on your mind. And so we do have some list of questions today, but today let me start just open a little bit about um, taking care of yourself, both physically and mentally. So I think that sometimes, um, well, I know people that tell me sometimes uh, people who have decreased sensation in their body, sometimes they'll say to me, well, you know, I don't feel that anyway. So I, they just kind of throw their bodies around. So physically, you want to really take care of your body because it your body does respond, even though you might not sense have those sensations, but your body does respond if it's injured or hurt or, you know, something's going on um, to areas where you don't have much sensation. So be careful when you're moving your body around, don't throw your legs around, pick up your uh, rear ends when you're doing your transfers, pick your body so it's not scraping along anything, causing either injury or either just some overstimulation to your body in some way. Be gentle when you're doing your transfers, be gentle when you're doing your bowel program. Um, I write a lot about that. You know, a lot of times people who have higher level injuries also have some spasticity or tone and they get very aggressive with their bowel program because they want to get it over and finished. And we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, colostomy in a little bit, but they want to get that over and finished. So they very aggressively, they do the digital stimulation because they're, get, they're working to get this process over. And that's really triggering more uh, spasticity or tone. So the more gentle you are with things, actually the faster the bowel program goes. Just, you know, kind of those little things that make a difference in your life. But also think about uh, your mental wellness. Now, I know when we talk about mental health, sometimes people get um, kind of up in arms a little bit. Well, I don't have anything wrong with my mental uh, thinking. And we're not talking about mental illness as in diagnostic diseases, but mental health. And just as you have to think of your body's mental wellness or your body's physical wellness, you have to think about your own mental wellness. Um, just, be, you know, some days we have up days. When's the Wednesday webinar is an up day for me. Um, some days we have days that, you know, we're not, you know, feeling on top of our game or, you know, we might be upset about something. We might have some anxiety or frustration. These are all normal feelings. But our mental well-being does better if we learn how to cope with them. So if you can, um, you know, you don't need to go this alone. There's a lot of resources out there that can help you. If you want to get into some support groups or if you want to uh, do other kinds of contact with people since we've been in and then with the COVID and then out, we could go out. Now we're kind of some of us are kind of a little leery of going out again. Um, so all of these kinds of things, you know, can certainly play with our, our uh, mental well-being because it can be kind of depressing sitting in your house all day, not really talking and interacting with other humans. On the other hand, some people really like sitting in their house all day and not talking to other humans. So, you know, you have to look at yourself and, you know, what kinds of things you like and how you can adapt to things. So you don't have to go it alone. There's a lot of resources if you can't get out of your house. If you can't get out of your house, there's a lot of research that says that if you talk to the people who check out your groceries, you know, if you look for that uh, one teller at the bank that you like to go to, or um, you get gas and you talk to the gas station guy. I love the guy that uh, monitors my gas station. He's this young kid. He, he, dresses like Elvis. I don't know. I do not know why. I've never asked him about that, but I just kind of see him. He puts a smile on my face. He's just one of those real affable people. And I always enjoy going to the gas station just because I get to see this guy. He's, he's a young kid, like my daughter's age, or maybe even younger, but he's just this young kid and he's out there doing his job and he's talking to people and it's just a delight. So 
even those kind of interactions are very helpful for our, our mental well-being. Even though we don't know somebody, we're not going, you know, out for coffee with them or we're not, you know, having them over for, as friends, but just people that you see in your life, when you make those human connections, that makes your brain feel good. So that's something you can do. Now, uh, there's, as I said, there's a lot of support groups on the internet. The Reed Foundation has great uh, different support groups that you can belong to. You can get involved in the community. Uh, Bill Crawley does this wonderful uh, organization of support groups. Um, if you are interested in something like that, go ahead and give it a try. You don't have to go in with expectations that I have to, you know, be on and say a lot of things. You can listen and and then as you feel comfortable, you can contribute some information. So that's that's kind of nice. Now, some people get really into, there's a few people, not a lot, but some people really get into um, their issue or concern. So some people really study about spinal cord injury. They get in support groups. They know a lot of information. Um, those people really challenge healthcare uh, professionals because they have made this their life's work because it makes them feel more comfortable that they're doing something that they want to be doing. And um, so it's kind of nice to, you know, to get in a group with somebody like that. Doesn't mean you have to be like that, but you might want to really just delve into this whole spinal cord thing or brain injury thing or whatever issue if you have a, a diagnosis like multiple sclerosis or something, you might want to really just delve into it. It might help your well-being to know that you're on top of things. Some people like that. Other people are like, no, I'm going to take care of my body. I'm going to do what I have to do. And then that's kind of, that's kind of it for me. I don't, I don't want to be in all of this. It's, it's, uh, just too overwhelming. I don't understand all the science and I don't want to, and, and that's fine too. So if you're that kind of person, you might want to join one of the words, want to look for something. Doesn't matter. Just as long as you're making contacts with people. That's the important thing is you don't have to go this alone. There are all kinds of professional people that can help you create, even if you're not having problems, but create resources. You if you do to period or you're having problems relating to another. look different or they have some kind of issue with their appearance or how they uh, relate to other people. If you're feeling that way, please remember there is not one human on this earth that is not self-conscious about something. For some people, what they're self-conscious about is more obvious. For other people, maybe you can't see what it is. Maybe they feel like they're not smart enough or they feel like they're not Pretty enough. And our social media, our TV, um, they all put forth this image of what we're supposed to be, how we're supposed to look. People are emulating um, different movie stars. I always, I always find that kind of interesting because, you know, when I look at some of these people, I see all this plastic surgery and hundreds of thousands of dollars spent in changing the way they look. And why are they doing that? because they didn't feel, they felt self-conscious probably, or that they felt like there was some opportunity if they looked a certain way, they could make more money or they could do things. But, but in some way, you know, that's all uh, comes from your mental health. If they felt fine in their own skin, they would have never gone out to go out and get all these surgeries and do all these things. So that, you know, sometimes they look, you know, it's like, you're wondering like, why did you do that? And then, and then uh, because they're followed on social media or whatever, they have a TV program, then other people go out and have these surgeries. I want to get a nose just like, uh, you know, XYZ celebrity. And, you know, it's like your nose is just fine. So um, all those kinds of things, you know, that we're all self-conscious about something. And if you find that you put yourself out there, you'll find there's a lot of people out there 
that are very kind and considerate and, you know, they'll, you know, chat a little bit. Next thing you know, maybe you get in a group, maybe you get in one of these spinal cord injury support groups. My theory is if you have survived one day, you have something valuable to talk about. It can be challenges that you have. It could be how you met those challenges. You'll see from these questions today, when people write in questions, it's something that they're thinking about. And it comes in all different ways, but it's something that people are thinking about. And by golly, it works because other people are thinking about that too. So don't ever think you're in your isolated cocoon that you're the only one or you're the only one that has these thoughts. That's what these groups are about. It really helps everybody um, when you participate in these. And if you choose to participate in another activity, that's great. It's all ways of meeting people forming friends, going out when we can go out more with the COVID. We're kind of in and out right now. But when we can go out and do things with people, we can take other opportunities to join clubs, become interested in different activities, start seeing and meeting new people, which is always a nice thing to do. Um, so um, the other thing I want to talk about, and this really fits in with the, um, the first question, that we have today fits in with the whole idea of um, the issues about COVID. And there's a big question about the COVID that's come up in the recent weeks and lots of information. And I thank Greg, he wrote in his question. Um, we, we've uh, gone back and forth uh, through the internet about his question, but I wanna bring it up because Greg's written this question. He's got, he's got the issue completely lined out right down to the letter. So basically what the, what the issue is, this whole idea of boosters has come up. Now it's been kind of bantered about, well, we need a booster, who knows? You know, we're all here in novel territory, so they're, they're figuring it out as they go, but they're doing a great job of figuring it out. Um, we have these vaccines, they're very effective. Um, there's very little risk about these vaccines. There has been some evidence that maybe the, that the vaccine uh, effectiveness drops off a bit. Now, the amount that it drops off is really a very, very small amount. But the bigger issue is that um, we have these other variants that are coming out. So uh, viruses mutate, that's what they do. That's their purpose of their life. They don't think about it, they just mutate. They're always trying to become stronger because they want the virus wants the virus itself to survive. And so um, um, the issue is that maybe some of the new variants are stronger. So maybe we do need our, our immunity boosted up a little bit. So when they came out with this boosters, they said, this is the group that we're gonna give the boosters to. And it's people who've had solid organ transplants, um, people who have HIV. And then there was this uh, list of, of individuals. And so people are thinking, well, now I have spinal cord injury. I'm immun immunocompromised due to the autonomic nervous system isn't maybe responding as well as it should. Now we do not know in which individuals have a better ANS system working than those who don't. The general rule is your ANS autonomic nervous system works better the lower your injury is and works less well, the higher your injury is. But that is not always true, as is everything. <laughs> That's the kind of the general rule, but it's not always true. So um, if you have a spinal cord injury, you can be classified as immunocompromised. That's perfectly legitimate. Now, why are you not in the special group to get the boosters first? And that is because this group that ha they have selected are individuals who are taking some kind of medication, maybe anti-rejection medication, some kind of medication that requires them to keep their bodies healthy. That medication, now that they've collected a lot of information from a lot of people that have had their shots, they found that maybe the, the, or the vaccines do not work as well in those individuals because perhaps those medications are blocking the vaccine from working as well. That is why they're in the first round to get the next, the first booster shot. 
So people with uh, spinal cord injury or brain injury, people who have or, or, um, uh, certain neurological diseases are immunocompromised, but are generally not taking medications that are known to affect these vaccines. Now, my friend, my new friend, Greg here has got this all, he's got the questions just all laid out for me. So I thank you again, Greg. Um, so that is why that one group is getting the boosters early. And there's been a lot of, of discussion because of the immunocompromised. Now, at first, the idea of this medication may be affecting their um, vaccines. It was, it came out early on and then it just kind of all disappeared. So I'm not sure if that was something that maybe wasn't as, uh, that people weren't as confident in. I'm not sure what happened to all that, but that's the reason that I know why this group is being uh, tested. Now, if you're not sure about your ability, you've had the vaccine and you're not sure about your immune system and how that's working, your autonomic nervous system, you can go get a blood test to see if the, how the vaccine's working in your body. It's very expensive. It more than likely will not be covered by insurance. But from what information we know is that you probably have immunity to the COVID, vac COVID virus if you have had the vaccine and you have a spinal cord injury. Now, we are all at the same risk of getting the COVID. All of us are exactly at the same risk. Those people who are immunocompromised and maybe have other risk factors will probably have a, a more intensive course of being ill if you catch the COVID than people who don't have risk factors. Yet again, some people have no risk factors and have severely horrible courses. Some people have um, many risk factors and hardly, you know, have any problem at all. Like, yeah, I had a headache maybe for a couple of hours. There are even people who have a lot of risk factors that didn't even realize that they had COVID until for some reason they had a test and, and they find out that something has happened. So, um, you know, it's, it's all up. Yes, if you have the risk factors, yes, you probably will become more ill if you get the COVID, but we can protect ourselves from getting, I do not have a spinal cord injury, but I do have a lot of the risk factors. I am immunocompromised. I say it all the time, not bragging about it, but just to say, I, that's one of the reasons why I'm so intent on all of this. Um, yes, I wanted the booster first too. You know, we all do, we're all scared to death of this thing, but um, we can protect ourselves. We can get the vaccine that certainly helps our um, immune system work. We can uh, wear a mask, we can wash our hands, we can social distance. With this Delta uh, virus becoming so prominent, now our vaccines work against the Delta, vi vi uh, the Delta variant. That's an important thing to know. There are more uh, variants that are upcoming. Since they're upcoming, we don't know the answer because they're not plentiful enough in the community yet to know the answer how the vaccines will work. But since that's what, facts, what viruses do, they just multiply and multiply and they get stronger and stronger. That's why we need everybody to get the vaccine or at least a critical mass of people to get the vaccine because if the, if the um, virus enters your body and you have an mRNA vaccine, it cannot enter your cells, therefore it cannot replicate, therefore it cannot become stronger and we have less chance of passing it around. If you've had the Johnson & Johnson, that's a traditional vaccine. That's the one where you have the one shot. That's a traditional vaccine where, you, like the flu shot, you're, giving, uh, you're given uh, either a dead virus or a replicated virus, something that mimics a virus. You cannot get sick from, if you get the injection, you cannot get the COVID from the, any of the vaccines but it will mimic that and you build up your own antibodies. And so people who have the vaccine, either way, they have less risk of getting the virus, certainly like at 94, 95% less risk. They also have um, an, less of an ability for it to enter their bodies to replicate. So it's, 
you know, it's ending with you. Um, the vaccine, the virus cannot be passed along. Well, you can carry it without, you know, you can have it in your nose. It hasn't entered your body. You could sneeze. You could uh, be in the bathroom, pass gas. It comes out a lot through the GI system and through the urinary system as well. Um, but anyway, you're, you're, you're safe. But you need to still, because of those variants out there and because of all the people that are not yet vaccinated, then that virus is just replicating and replicating in them. They might not even have symptoms and realize it's there. So you need to just be vigilant. We still need to be extra vigilant and extra cautious. Follow all of the rules, especially if we're, uh, if you're an individual who's using a chair sitting lower than other people who might be talking above you. The spray is coming out of their mouth because there is a little bit of moisture that comes out of her mouth when we talk. Those virus drop, gravity brings everything down eventually. So, you know, you're kind of in the line of fire being lower than everybody. Um, keeping your rims uh, uh, clean. Um, because if you're pushing outside or, you know, you're out in the world, you could be picking up a, a virus and, you know, not even realizing it or any bacteria. Um, if you're using... Um, a walker or if you're walking with assistive devices, you want to keep your, take your shoes off before you come in the house. If you're not walking with an assistive device, you want to have your outside shoes and your inside shoes because you don't want anything uh, spreading around. So, um, uh, so, this, so Greg goes on to ask about what does moderately to mildly to moderately to severely Im immunocompromised mean? And that's what they're talking about is they're talking about people with these uh, really uh, severe immunocompromised because they're taking medicines to prevent rejections from their body. So that's what that, that's what that is all about. So should you get the booster shot? Sure, absolutely. Um, now see, now Greg really got this because he's got some questions. Does being a T8, having this T8 spinal cord injury qualify me for the booster? Yes, it qualifies you as immunocompromised, but not in this first round that's been um, indicated by the CDC. So we'll all be able to get our boosters here coming up in September in just no time at all. They do want you to wait eight months from when you had your first, from when you had your, either your Johnson & Johnson shot or from when you had your second of your mRNA, the Pfizer or the Moderna shot. They want you to wait at least um, eight months from that. So I had mine in March. So like Greg, I won't be eligible until November. And so, but that's okay because I've got my immunities from my first one. So that's good. Okay, so does being susceptible to autonomic dysreflexia qualify me? It won't qualify you as uh, immunocompromised. However, I, I encourage everyone who has autonomic dysreflexia, or if you have a spinal cord injury above um, the T6 mark, uh, some people have uh, AD even lower than that. Some people with brain injury or neurological disease also have autonomic dysreflexia. So whenever you go out or wherever you are, you should always have your uh, equipment ready with you because if you do get an injection into your arm, that's something noxious that your body might, especially if it's below the level of injury, that's something noxious that's going in your body that could trigger an autonomic response. It's not the vaccine that's going to trigger it. It's that injection, that pricking of your skin and, and the fluid going into a pocket into your arm. Now, um, when this all first came out with the injections, the CDC recommended to go up here in the arm. And so that's where all the shots were given. Now they have gone, and I didn't understand why you couldn't have it in uh, the, the top of your thigh, which is another injection site similar to up here in the arm. So individuals who have spinal cord injury can, or anybody can have it, if they prefer to have it, the injection in their thigh, you can have it done that way. The CDC has, has two sites now. So if you have AD and you would like to have it in your thigh, maybe where you won't have as much sensation and won't even feel the shot, um, then um, you wanna be cautious 
and be prepared for AD. So carry with you the Christopher and Dana Reed Paralysis Foundation wallet card for AD. Always have that with you. If you have AD and you have medications and you know you want to monitor your blood pressure, be sure you have your blood pressure cuff, your medications, everything with you. Now, am I saying that you're going to have an AD episode from the, the vaccine? Absolutely not. There's no evidence that having this injection will trigger an AD episode. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. However, it behooves every anybody who has AD or might be susceptible to be AD to be prepared at all times because it is uh, something that could bother the body. It could trigger an episode. The odds are like minuscule that this is going to happen. But if you are very susceptible to AD, it could possibly happen. And that's my role is to think about these effects for people who have paralysis that the rest of the world's not thinking about. So that's that's what I have to say about that. It's not something like, oh, I better not get it, I'll get AD. No, no, get the shot. Um, AD, if you have an episode which is next to nothing that you're gonna have that, but just you know, always be prepared. Even if you're going out to dinner, be prepared. You just never know what that AD, it's sneaky. Okay. Um, does being 69 qualify me? Well, that's the way it was in the first round. The oldest people got it first. So we don't know how the boosters will be distributed if they'll follow the same pattern. Now they, they know how to, how to do these max, mass vaccinations. They know that process. So I don't know if they'll do it by age or if they'll just say, y'all come. Uh, you know, we don't have that information yet. Um, uh, being male. That's an interesting question because there is some evidence um, that females have less COVID than males. Hmm, something about the hormones. Now, do we know that's the answer? No, that's just their suspicion that it could be. Um, so who, who knows? As the variants come, maybe gender will make no difference. We don't know that yet. But there is this little tickle of an idea um, so, you know, being male, we, that push you to the head of the line? No, but, you know, it, it doesn't do anything either way, really. Um, so, um, also, and so anyway, that was, he they hadn't thought about the AD ramifications. And again, I don't want to alarm people. I don't want to alert people. I don't want anybody to misconstrue what I'm saying. AD will not be a result of the vaccine. But if you do ha have a tendency towards that way, yes, it, you know, it could trigger an AD episode, so always be prepared, but sitting on a wrinkle could be. Um, I was talking to a gentleman who was having AD and he finally discovered it was because he liked to wear jeans and those rivets on the jeans were stimulating his AD. So, you know, AD comes from uh, ingrown toenails. It comes from your shoes being too tight. It comes from uh, you put your leg bag on. If you have a le if you use a leg bag for a urinary drainage and the strap is too, uh, fine when you put it on, but it fills with urine and the leg bag becomes heavy. Uh, the straps become a compressing your leg and they have an AD episode. So, you know, it happens from anything. It happens. I've had people that um, have said that they've gotten AD episodes from too long of use on their computer. And there is a group in the um, Sweden or Norway, Scandinavian countries who, have, who are doing research on this and something about the lighting on the computer. Now the computer people say this is not true, but yet when they take people who have high level injuries and put them in front of computers, they're having some AD episodes. So, you know, these are the things that we need to know about. Um, so, okay, then, so I hope that I've answered all the questions, Greg. I've kind of gotten to my little thing about uh, COVID. So um, I went uh, over and beyond on that one. So, okay, the next question is also, again, this is why people are so interesting because this next question is from Anna or Anna which I'm not sure of the exact way, but she, this is a great question. And I, I never really had considered this before in the way that this person's viewing this question. So it is, I'm wondering about UTIs and if it's okay to take aquatic therapy in a heated pool while you have a UTI, 
and if that can contribute to getting a UTI because of the heated pool. Well, now this is the thing. We recommend heated pool for people who are doing aquatic therapy because the warmth of the water tends to relax. So if you have spasticity, it tends to relax you. If you have um, multiple sclerosis, sometimes the, the cold can affect your uh, disease your muscles can cramp up in the cold. And that with aquatic therapy, we'd like to use that because the buoyancy of the water helps movement. Whereas if you're doing like aquatic exercise and you're pushing through the water, the water uh, provides resistance. But in aquatic therapy, you want gentle movements. And so people find in aquatic therapy while they're doing this, the water supporting their movements, their arms, their legs, the water supporting that movement and they find movement that they couldn't do outside of the water because of gravity. But that buoyancy of the water help holding up and that gentle movement. So once you find that movement, then the therapist and people can work with you on harnessing that movement to your benefit on gravity. So it's really great. So for aquatic th or th therapy, what we recommend is if you are um, self-catheterizing, that you self-catheterize before, you wanna think about if your sphincter is competent. So if your sphincter is closed, your urinary sphincter, if that is closed, um, if you have an indwelling catheter, some people will remove that before they go in the pool. Sometimes the sphincter is dilated from that catheter and so that makes an open conduit for that pool water to get in there. So you have to you know, check with your physician about what you should be doing. If you have a super pubic catheter that goes through a little opening in your abdomen, you need to put a piece of plastic over that so water doesn't, you know, plastic tape or dressing with plastic so that's sealed off so the water can't leak into that opening. Now, I think that the interesting thing about this question is the heated pool. And I think that uh, people start thinking about UTIs because of um, hot tubs and people who are in warm hot tubs that are not chemically treated like pool waters chemically treated tend to have more infections from hot tubs than pools. So you see this person, Anna's thinking about this and putting it all together. So can you get an infection from a pool Yes, anybody can get an infection from anything. Is it likely that you're gonna get it from a pool? Not very likely um, because, of, because of the treatment of the water. And if your urethra is closed, then nothing should be entering that. Now, to bring up something a little bit out there, there are some people who get in a pool and they feel the urge to relieve their bladder and they do that in the pool. And then you've got that in the pool. If they have a UTI, they've released their bacteria into the pool. You know, I don't know why people do this, but you know, some pools they put in uh, chemicals so that if somebody urinates in the pool, it changes color and everybody knows. And so that has helped a lot, but usually the chemicals in the pool if there's a bacteria in there, somebody has urinated in the pool, the chemicals in the pool will neutralize that, or at least that's the plan. Now, does that always happen? I do not know, because I don't know that much about that, but that is what the idea of all that is. That's why the chemicals are in there, so that infection is not passed around in the pool. So um, also there are um, things that might be required of you. Uh, you can use a swim diaper if you can't control your bladder, should catheterize if you're doing catheterization. You should catheterize before you get in the pool so that your bladder is empty. You might wanna wear a swim diaper or an adult diaper. Um, it's recommended that before you have your aquatic therapy that you have a bowel program if you're doing bowel programs, because you know the, the buoyancy of the water relaxes all your muscles, including those in your abdomen. So sometimes people can be incontinent. That's why the bowel program um, to empty the bowel so that there's not an accident. Because if there is, everybody's out of the pool. It has to be drained and cleaned. And so, you know, that's a big endeavor. And it, you know, it kind of ruins everybody's therapy for that day. So um 
and you want to take all the precautions that you can, be sure and talk to your healthcare professional to make sure that aquatic therapy is safe and be sure and ask for the uniqueness that is you. Um, you know, because I, I speak in generalities. And so um, you always want to check, you know, for yourself directly with what's going on. Now, I saw a question that came through um, through the chat box and somebody wanted to know about speaking Spanish and there is an interpreter available at the Reed Foundation. So if you do have a question and you speak Spanish, you can communicate with that Spanish speaking interpreter and she will translate it for me. I will give her an answer and she'll translate it back for you. So great, that's a good system. And we've done that and it works well. Um, so um, another question is, if having the COVID and recovered, is it necessary to get the vaccine since natural antibodies are present? Um, that is a big question that a lot of people have. Mostly the vaccine is recommended because of the variants. So if you had the, you know, now this is another interesting thing and I do wanna bring this up. Um, if you've had the COVID back in the beginning, it was a different virus than some of these new variants are. Um, so if you had the COVID and you had the, say, say it early on in the beginning, you will have antibodies for that particular uh, virus, but will that antibody work on the Delta variant? And that's what's unknown. So that's why it's better to be on the safe side and go ahead and get the vaccine. Now you'll need to talk to your healthcare professional because there is a time that you need to wait. And the reason why I like to bring this up is because people I do not think appreciate um, how, uh, vi how viruses mutate and change into something else. Something I noticed on the TV just a few weeks ago is remember when they show the COVID virus, they show that round ball and it's got these funny little spikes on it with these little red tips on it. It's real curious looking uh, thing, but that's what the virus looks like under the microscope. So on the TV, they show this big picture of this virus and they have these red tips on it. Now when they show it, or even when you go to the CDC website, and they show a picture of the COVID virus, you'll notice the tips have turned blue because we have more of the Delta variant now than the original COVID. It's, it's changed into something else. And there's another variant that's out on the horizon, the Lambda, and we don't know that much about it because it's not out there that much, but it is here in the United States. It is around the world. And we don't know much, much about that, but if we could get this nipped in the bud, if enough people would get the vaccine that it couldn't be spread around, then it can't mutate. And I wanna say it goes away, but viruses never go away. They'll still be out there. We just won't get them because we've been inoculated against them and we've become immune to it. So even like the polio virus, you know, people take the polio vaccine, people take the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine and eventually the flu vaccine, and eventually we'll just have the COVID vaccine and we won't be, there won't be all this big hoopla about it. Now, the Pfizer vaccine has been approved. So, um, you know, that, so it's out of research. The Moderna is going to probably be approved even within the next couple of weeks. So these are not research uh, vaccines anymore. These are, are things that are, have been proven effective and they've been proven safe. So there we have that. Um, here's somebody who's writing in, Lolly, about um, how can I help since my husband spent 60 years in a wheelchair? Will Lolly join some of these groups because there are families um, that would love to have your wisdom and what you've been through and how you've dealt with things and you know even your day to day how did you manage things all these things are so important um, getting equipment uh, all these things are just critical um, sometimes people will have a little um, trick that they do that they, they just kind of worked it out on their own and it's like oh everybody's like that's magical that would help us all so get involved um, you can go on at the Christopher and Dana Reed Prowse, uh, Foundation website and there's a place called the community there's a group a subgroup in there called the WAGs wives and girlfriends 
And, you know, they would, they would just adore you, I'm sure, because they are just, they, they are such an active group. They're just this fabulous uh, group of people. And um, it, the, yes, please help. <laughs> we need you. Um, okay. And then there's another question in here, and there's a couple of questions about colostomy. And so I do want to bring this up. We talk about it periodically, but I do want to bring it up because there's a couple of questions about it. So a lot of people um, don't enjoy the bowel program. It takes a long time for some people. Um, there are some tips, like if you um, do that digital stimulation in a more gentle man manner, that's helpful. But for some people, this bowel program is just, you know, it's a never ending uh, scenario. Um, if you can, if the suppositories are not working effectively, um, you can try some of the mini enemas there's enemies and Theravac. Um, those seem to work quicker for people. Sometimes people don't put the suppository in up against the bowel wall, but they stick it, just stick it straight in and it gets caught in the middle of stool. If it's not against the bowel wall, it will not melt. It will not stimulate the bowel into action. So they put their suppository in, they're waiting, 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 nothing's happening because the suppository has never melted. So if you, the, if you have stool in your rectum, you need to take that out before you put the suppository in. Now we used to say, just push it over to the side of the uh, bowel so it'll be up against the bowel wall. Now we say, just get that um, stool that's in the very lower part of the bowel, just take that out right away so that you get the maximum benefit of the suppository or the mini enema. So these are, these are just little tips that, you know, and people are like, oh, it's not gonna make much difference, but it does. So be sure and try all those, you know, little tips and time savers and uh, see if that helps. But there, for some people they think, well, I wanna get this colostomy. And there are some people that get the colostomy, a large number of people who get it, that just swear by it, they would never go back. There are many people who also get the colostomy and are very disappointed. I am not saying get it, I'm not saying don't get it. I just like people to know, to think about all of the elements. Um, number one, surgery is very serious. It's very serious for everyone. A lot of times people think, oh, surgery, I've even heard surgeons say, oh, it's like a day at the spa. You have a really good nap. No, you're having anesthesia. That affects your breathing. You're going on a respirator to breathe for you. When you have um, a spinal cord injury, you can have trouble getting off the, the ventilator. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. Um, some people, do, um, and they're very, very few, but some people do not survive the colostomy. I've had patients that have been gung-ho. I want this colostomy because I don't want people doing this. I don't want the time. I don't want to have my caretaker uh, doing this. It's my spouse. And I don't, I don't want that as a part of our lives. And they've got, those are all good and legitimate reasons. And unfortunately, I have I have known people that have had very unfortunate outcomes because of the colostomy. Now, another thing is that once you have the colostomy, you will be wearing a bag on your abdomen to collect the stool. So sometimes people are kind of like, well, I didn't want them doing the bowel program, but I don't want them changing the colostomy bag either, but the colostomy bag has to be changed. So if you aren't, don't have the dexterity to do that, you'll, you'll need to have somebody do that for you. Now, oftentimes I, when you talk to the family member or the person who's doing the bowel program, they're like, I really, I really just don't care. I, I do it. It just doesn't bother me at all. But when you're the person that's having it done to you, you have maybe different feelings about that. And so, you know, we need to recognize all of these kinds of things. Um, so um, now this is something that really bothers your friend, Nurse Linda. When you look at the pictures of people who have colostomies, when you see how, you know, what it looks like and what's going on, they're always the manufacturers always release these pictures of people with a six, six pack abdomen. They're always totally muscular and they're very fit. And those bags work very well on that type of abdomen. If you have relaxed muscles, they don't really 
work so well. Much to our benefit, there's a whole cadre of nurses that specialize in doing nothing more than teaching people how to deal with their colostomy. And they will work to the till their last bone um, to get that colostomy to uh, stay on the abdomen. There are some times that people have a wonderful colostomy program, everything's working out just great, everything's fine. And they have a blowout because everybody gets diarrhea or gas for whatever reason, maybe not even sick, just sometimes we get anxious and these things happen, our bowel responds. You know, the body works all together and the bowel is one of those telltale, uh, you're a little bit nervous, hey, you got a little bit of anxiety, wow, I'm releasing everything I got in there. Um, so these things happen. So sometimes the colostomy bag blows off. So, you know, people have them, they are wildly successful, but just know that, you know, these are things that you might be confronted. Now, an advantage when you have a planned colostomy is you get to pick where you have the colostomy done. So, hey, that's kind of a cool kind of thing. So you can have it close, closer to the rectum, but in the large intestine, not down by the rectum, but you can have uh, the colostomy done there and the stool in the bag will be more like form stool. As you go up further in the large intestine, the stool will be more watery. So, um, you know, talk to, talk to your healthcare professional, talk to the interested parties, your family or caregivers who's ever dealing with this with you. And you can decide, do you want more of a form stool type of um, bag emptying? procedure? Or do you want more of a, a liquid kind of thing? Um, there are reasons for doing both. Um, let's see, there was something else I was, oh, in, in healthcare, um, we like to keep the bowel working as long as we can in its natural habitat. So we like uh, the bowel program because it stimulates the natural action of the bowel, and then we kind of save colostomy for if there's a problem later down the road. But the problem later down the road could be, I cannot stand this bowel program another second. But the reality of it is you need to know all these things. So some people go in thinking, I'm gonna have this colostomy, I'm gonna have this bag. Um, I know the other question about it is um, for the person, and they're wondering about how the bag gets changed because they don't have help with the bowel program. No, I don't really know of any payer source that has somebody come in just to do the bowel program. If you have somebody coming in for other activities um, like bathing or maybe you're higher level and you need more physical help in doing things, Sometimes the bowel program could be included in that, but just to have somebody to come in to do the bowel program, payers don't pay for that. That's up to you or it falls to your family member or your caregiver. It's an unfortunate kind of thing because sometimes, um, especially in spouse situations, they you know want to keep that part of life separate. And that's certainly understandable. So there are very legitimate reasons besides um, the way the bowel's working, but psychological and mental health. That's what we're talking about, being kind to yourself. And if you think that this would make an improvement, but talk to people who've had it done. Ask if, if there's anybody, go on the Reef Foundation, start a chat about colostomy. Hey, did it work for you? Were there problems? Because you're going to get all kinds of answers about that. And those are very important. That's important information to have. You might think, well, maybe, you know, I want to wait another year before I do this. Or maybe I want to have it now because in another year, I'll be another year older. So I just want to have it while I'm more healthy. So, um, you know, there's just all kinds of things. But think about, you know, when you think about physical, also think about your mental health. And the colostomy may be the answer. Um, but, you know, you have to go in knowing all of these things. Um, now we have another question here about, um, uh, this person says, and I have to love you for it, um, it may be off the subject. There's nothing off the subject in this, in this webinar. We go everywhere. Okay, so don't worry about that. But um, the person's son keeps getting uh, bed sores and his legs don't relax. 
um, and he's very tight and his hip, hips are stuck to one side. And I'm trying to figure out what I could do to fix this situation. So it sounds like there's um, either some severe spasticity or tone, which is keeping those legs tight, or maybe it's been going on so long now there's contractures. So you could talk to somebody to do an evaluation to find out if there's tone, there's medication that can be taken orally to reduce the tone, works throughout the whole body, or um, there's Botox injections, which is really the thing that most people are doing now because that's an injection into those muscles that help relax them. Um, it has to be repeated uh, frequently. Uh, at certain intervals, these injections have to be repeated. Uh, some people don't like that, but some people, you know, hey, I'll take them because it's really helping my tone. Um, so that works very well. That medicine doesn't travel throughout your body like the oral medication does. If that's working out and, it's, and the tone is still uh, really uh, bothersome, you can uh, get a an implant. Uh, it goes, actually, the implant has medication. It goes into the front in the abdomen, but there's a little tube that runs around. It's placed under the skin that goes into the area where the spinal cord is. It does not go into the spinal cord, but it bathes that uh, cerebral spinal fluid, and so it relaxes the whole lower half of the spinal cord, which relaxes the body then. Now, if the um, if the spasticity has become so tight that it cannot be stretched out, there might be some contractures. And in which case there's um, some procedures that can be done to help with those contractures. Uh, it may require surgery to help relax those, but when you have that much tension in there, that there could be some contraction. Sometimes they can do something as simple as what's called serial casting or serial bracing. So if you have a contraction in your fig finger, they can slowly just start by adjusting the brace or doing splints and over time, slowly, slowly, slowly stretch that out. So there's a lot of different things that can help here. And then you wanna keep um, the pressure off the areas where there's pressure injury. You wanna keep the pressure off of that. Now people get pressure injury from laying on bony prominences but also where that contracture is. So where that leg is bent, you can get um, some injury in there to the soft tissue in there because it's hard to get in there and wash and clean. And it's just not getting the air and circulation that it needs. Sometimes that's just so tight in there that um, you can get pressure injuries in, inside um, these contracted or spastic, spasmed areas. So you need to go to somebody to talk about these because you, you want to get those uh, pressure injuries uh, healed up because that's, that's a risk area for um, all kinds of complications. Um, you know, your skin is meant to be closed. That's why we have skin all over our body. That's our, our protection against the world, so to speak. So all of those kind of things. So there's a whole bunch of ideas. So first of all, go to your primary care um, practitioner who's taking care of your son and tell him, you, you know, that there's these, um, the spasms, what can be done about it? How can we heal these bed sores, this pressure injuries? Um, bed sores is what we all call it, but um, bed sores is what everybody calls it. In healthcare, we call them pressure injuries. So these, this is not, um, anybody's fault. You don't have to feel like guilty when you go there. You, you've provided excellent care for your son. And another way that you're continuing that excellent care is by getting um, treatment uh, for these pressure injuries and um, helping to relax those legs. Um, after you get them, after you get the tone reduced or the contractures reduced, you do have to exercise the legs and move them every day or else it comes back. So you have to do this continual movement. But go to the doctor first before you start doing that because if there's contractures and you try to stretch those, that's gonna rip those muscles and damage those muscles. So go to your doctor, start from, start from the beginning and just, work through the process. So this, this, is, a, this is a fixable uh, situation. 
but start from the very beginning and, and that will work out um, well for you. That's gonna uh, do it. That's gonna do well. Um, let's see. Um, oh, it's just somebody is writing in that they're working from home. Whoops. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I put my tablet down and it landed right on my camera because um, I like to keep the questions right here in front of me. So um, anyway, um, we're coming near to the uh, time to the end of our time, but I do want to bring up uh, something about uh, next month. I want everybody to know that next month we're having uh, two special guests from the American Occupational uh, Therapy Foundation. And um, they're experts in the field of occupational therapy. They're both um, community leaders. Um, I know both of them and they're just outstanding people who are on the cutting edge of everything occupational therapy. So they're gonna be coming and, and talking to us about what's new on the horizon. You can ask questions and it'll be the same kind of format. They'll do a little presentation and then I'll, I'll uh, be uh, reading their questions. Uh, to them so that they can answer your questions. So this is going to be a really fun day because we're going to find out latest and greatest things. We're going to find out uh, what will help what. Uh, so it's, it'll be, it'll be, I think, a very broad uh, coverage. I think everybody will learn something new. I think it, it's not going to be, um, you know, this is only research and you can't get this now. These are really people who are, um, who are um, into knowing what's going on. And so it's gonna be really helpful. Uh, there's real quick questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you and other health professionals advise wearing a mask. Yes, however, there are no standards for all. How effective can they be? Okay, so this is a good question. Um, yes, actually everybody should be wearing a mask. It's unfortunate as some people will not get um, vaccinated, they will not wear masks. And that's unfortunate because they're just spreading it around. So you really need to wear a mask. The best ones are the kind that are um, pressed like surgical mask, or I don't have mine here because I'm upstairs. I keep mine by my door. So I wear it whenever I go out. Um, I have them all over, but I don't have any upstairs because I don't interact with people here in the upstairs of my house. But um, I have one that's called a K95. And when they first came out, you know, the N95 was the, the mask to have. But those were saved for hospital use. This KN95, I think I left the N out. KN95 is a, a formed mask. It's very um, protective. It fits, it fits not tightly, but it fits very snugly around here around your area, it comes up here, kind of fits more like around here. Um, and so it, it's, it, they say that that is the one or these press paper ones are the ones to have now. A handkerchief, if you hold the handkerchief up to the light and you look at it and you see that light coming through, that's all the bacteria, all the places where the bacteria can come through. So for a while they were saying a handkerchief or a bandana, those are really not very effective at all. They have, the holes are too big. If you think about a, a COVID virus and how tiny that is, it is so very tiny. It's smaller than um, an atom. It is so tiny. So if, you know, you could, if you took a piece of hair and cut it on the tip of that piece of hair, you can put, put like, a, you could line up like 150,000 COVID viruses they're tiny. So you need something that's really very effective. Now, um, you can, if you have a cloth mask, you want it to be at least double cloth. Um, if you, there are some that you can put filters in between the two pieces of cloth, which is also very helpful. I like to use, um, sometimes even with my mask, I'll put a filter in there. And what I use and this is kind of uh, odd, but I use napkins that come from fast food chains, that quality. If you ever go to a fast food place and you use a napkin and you wipe the grease off your hand, 
you just see the grease laying on this napkin because it doesn't absorb because it is so, it's pressed paper and things don't get through on those napkins. You can buy them at any store, but I, I mention these because when I say it, like at the fast food chain, fold it so it comes in over your nose and mouth, put your mask over. Now, if you do not have hand function to remove the mask on your own or you're under the age of two, you should not be wearing a mask because um, you can re-breathe your uh, oxygen, especially if you have a, a filter in there, which can cause you to get sleepy and you fall asleep. Somebody sees you, oh, they're sleeping, but you're not getting your oxygen. So that's very, you have to be very careful about this. If you, if you feel like you have too much in your mask and you just have that KN95, that's, that's sufficient. If you have a cloth mask and you want to put a filter in there, now you can use paper towel, but they have a lot of loose fibers in there. So you're breathing that in. If you have respiratory problems, you'd be breathing in those loose fibers. That's why I say those cheap napkins, they work really great. Um, so um, yeah, somebody has on there an N95. Um, those were out first. They have that little breather in there, so they let the air out, but they don't let the air in. Sometimes uh, they're saying that if you have that little plug on the outside, that the COVID can get in uh, while that air is coming out. Uh, I don't know that, I guess, because, you know, it's pushing out. So could the COVID get in there? I suppose that's wildly possible. So um, N95s are uh, what they're using in hospital environments, but these KN95s you can actually get. Um, one last thing, our time is up. It's been a pleasure being uh, with you today. I wanna say happy birthday to my mom. She turns 94 on Friday, go mom. So um, anyway, have, stay safe, stay protected, be cautious. Hopefully we'll be out of this soon. We keep saying that um, if more people would get their vaccines, we could be out sooner. So um, I'm just saying. Uh, so, okay, thank you very much. It's been wonderful being with you today.